Okay, my name is Pablo Neira, um, and he is Patrick Mahadi, and we are part of the NFT core team, and we are going to talk about um, NF table. This is the NF table tutorial. Whoops. This is not working very well. Yes. Good. So. Um, well, NFTL is, uh, as you probably know, is um, a new uh, packet classification framework in the frame of the NFTL project. Um, it has come to replace um, IP, IP6, ARP, and EB tables. Um, and the design is based on the lesson learned from, from, from these tools. And well, IP table was designed for those that um, lack a bit of history. Uh, IP tables. IP tables was designed in was implemented in 1988. Um, it's uh, compared to IP to NF tables is a relatively simple design. Um, basically, uh, it provides a method to to load to load the rule set expressed as a huge binary blob that is passed between user space and kernel space using um, get sock and sec sock options and uh, it has it has uh, extensions that basically where I have have been used and also abused but <laughs> for uh, for many different purposes. So uh, uh, these these extensions, for example, they, they allow you to to match uh, uh, specific protocol fields, but also perform very different actions. These uh, extensions, you probably know, they are matches what we what we call matches and targets. Um, from the original IP tables code uh, derivated the the what the the IP6 tables just later on because in the initial design of IP tables the uh, family uh, the layer 3 family independency was not considered so what we had uh, almost uh, just after the beginning was a copy almost a copy and paste of of the um, matching engines of IP, IP6 tables, and ARP, later on ARP, and then bridge, uh, especially um, bridge, the bridge family, EB tables, has um, diverged quite far from, from the original code. And, and that, that I, I'll discuss later on, but that has caused us a bit of, of trouble when implementing the compatibility layers. But, um, so, NF table was uh, initially presented by Patrick in, in the NF filter workshop in Paris in 2008. And it was released finally in, in uh, March 2009. Uh, it's been merged to mainstream in October 2013. And it's available since Linux kernel 3.13. Uh, um, it was beginning last year. And well, basically the idea is that we reused existing building blocks so we didn't uh, throw down all, all the stuff. We, we, we are still reusing all the hooks, the, the hook infrastructure, the connection tracking, the net, uh, NAT, login, user space que que queuing, and so on. So basically it's, it's, it's what, we have, what we are replacing, it's a packet classification and, and, all, and, 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 and the way we, we can match and, and, and perform actions on, on, on matching rules. And all, we also introduce uh, a generic uh, set infrastructure and many more facilities that I'm going to discuss in this presentation with Patrick. And we also provide an, a way to, to reuse the existing extensions through the NFT compat. So this, this code is not still available, but there is, I have a patch to, to that allows, um, allows us to use um, the X tables extensions from NFT. So uh, meanwhile, we don't have a native replacement. We will be able to use uh, the X tables extensions. So probably the main question is um, why we needed a new packet filtering, packet classification framework. So why 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 do we did we need a NF tables and I'd say the 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 main the main answers are um, well we, we needed to uh, to address IP tables architectural designs problems 
and there was no way to make it without without rebuilding the the core infrastructure. So from the kernel from the from the kernel side, what we wanted to get rid of. Um, uh, was basically the code application. As I said, we had four families, and so this in in um, in many cases resulted in in some, uh, sometimes having to apply almost four times at work case the same patch to um, to this to, to to each family. There was some some work to generalize that and to avoid that and to reduce the amount of, of replicated code. But at some point, uh, we got cornered, and there was no way to escape without um, changing the interface or changing the way we were representing the rules and, and so on. So um, another another thing that was uh, missing was an ending API that, for example, includes even notifications. That is, that is something that users has been asking for quite some time, so they can track the changes that happen uh, in the rule set, or they can just make some small demo that can uh, subscribe to those events and, and perform some action on, on rules updates. And another, another problem that we had with, uh, with IP tables was the lack of dynamic and, well, the, the very limited um, uh, incremental update support. Um, so, Basically, as, as we were just yes, all, all the time, when, when we had large rule set, we have to pass those large binary blobs between kernel and user space, and then synchronize counters, and also counters lose, lose the states of, of the rules that were already loaded. It was, um, so the AP tables and F tables uh, consider that and provides better, um, it provides a better solution in that regard. And also another concern was, of course, the linear uh, rules of evaluation. So we provide a generic set infrastructure that allows us to implement, allows us to represent the rules at, uh, uh, as a tree using dictionaries. So the number of, uh, of rules that you have to consult to, to reach uh, a final verdict or action on the packet uh, gets, gets reduced, which is what usually reduces performance and increases latency. So um, on the user space side, we wanted also to improve the syntax, and, and it seems it seems, um, um, it, seems it's, it, it got better. We, we we got at least way less dash dash uh, things. So, and also proper user space libraries for third-party software, which was another. Um, Another concern we we had uh, leap uh, IPD that have to, actually it's still being used by by uh, many projects, but um, the uh, project policy has been so far to um, uh, to to tell users that that API was not stable and that that library was internal only for for um, for IP tables for the, for our, our command line utility. So the the official interface so far has been uh, IP table restore and. And what we have, what we've been telling users is to pipe commands to 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 that to that utility, and and well that that is kind of limited. It, in the level of integration that you can get is of course not the best. So, um, so um, the code is already in the kernel. Um, if you want to fetch the code, it's it's available in in the git in the filter repositories. And um, we already got documentation. We got demand pages, and we got a how-to that is still um, being in enhanced. And, and well, if, if you test this software, um, it would be we would really appreciate if you can just have a look at Bookzilla, check if there is a, a book file um, with a problem that you 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 have noticed, and otherwise just file file it and try to uh, provide as much information and, uh, as possible to, so we can reproduce it and fix it as soon as, as, soon as possible. Yeah. Right. If I might interrupt, um, this sounds like you will hit a bug almost certainly, uh, what Pablo's telling. <coughs> uh, it's pretty much usable for, um, well, anything maybe, but if you want to use it for your commercial product or something, you might want to do some testing, but otherwise it, you, it, you should be fine. Um, 
bugs are hit rarely, I, I would say. Okay, if you find any bug, you tell Patrick. <laughs> Okay, so um, what objects uh, objects do, do we have in in NF tables? We have well as as we used to have in in previous uh, NetFilter um, NetFilter uh, Firewall and Tool incarnations. We had we have of course, of course tables and we have also chains. Um, but in this case, uh, tables are they they have uh, slightly changed. They 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 have no semantics anymore. They they have become containers of chains. Um, so you cannot expect to have a, let's say, filter table that is only going to have filter chains. In this case, but now what you can do is you can have, uh, you can create a table with whatever name, the one you prefer. That table is going to be uh, attached to, to a given family. We have currently five families, IP, IP6, INET, bridge, ARP. IP for IP, IP4 traffic, IP6 for IP6 traffic. In INET is a special table that allows us to create a filter chain, which is um, designed for dual stack uh, configurations. We also have bridge, and just for filtering uh, when, when the bridge configuration is enabled and filtering for ARP traffic. Who's saying anything? Okay, so well, chains, um, they are containers of rules, they, they contain the list of rules. We have two types of chains, we have base chains and non-base chains. Before, in IP tables, we used to call, we used to name this, the name we used to use was um, custom chain and built-in chain, but we have no built-in things anymore. That's not an important change. So. Everything is configured by the user. The user explicitly creates a table with the name he wants to. The user also creates chains and configures where, what kind of chains they want to create. We have three different kinds. Filter, uh, route, and NAT with different semantics. And those three different, you could create chains of different type in the same table. And basically, it, it's everything is configurable. So, non-based chains are those chains that are not hooked, don't, not, that are not don't see traffic, um, um, don't see traffic in, in, in any of the on the five hooks that we we, uh, we have in the stack. And um, so those needs to be at the, the non-based chains are attached using jump and and go to um, actions from rules that are located in a from a base chain, right? So I'm going to just make stop talking and make a short demo. So basically, yes. Oh, enhance it, uh, expand it, right? Yes. Hi. Um, the semantics, how, how different is the syntax for uh, NF tables and IP tables? That is one question. And uh, the next, next question is, if I already have IP table rules in production, can I just do a find and grab to change it to NF tables? I'm going to start with uh, the syntax. Well, the syntax is completely different. Um, IP tables use an get op based parsing function, um, which is why you had tons of dashes, um, very long option names, so you would avoid clashes. And if tables uses a well-defined grammar, and um, it's completely different, it's more, it will probably remind you more of TCP dump or PCAP uh, than of um, the original IP tables. Pablo can probably answer the compatibility question better. Um, yes, I, I'll show you in, in, the, in this presentation. We, we have tools, the, basically the name is IP tables, um, minus, compat. The idea is that um, distributors, they can just um, um, provide a same link to, to the compat utility and users when invoking IP tables, they, were, they will be using the compatibility layer 
without noticing when transitioning from from IP tables to to NF tables. So in that in that regard, they will be transparently using the NF tables cores core without without noticing. And also uh, another another in, in that direction, the idea is to add the glue code in NFT. So if you load the IP tables uh, rule set using IP tables compat while listing your rule set from NFT, you are going to you are going to you you will see the uh, the IP tables ruled with with a special syntax so within brackets so so you um, so you can detect what what is what is using the XT extensions and. I, I'll I'll sh I, I'll show you the I, I'll show you I make some example on the compatibility that you work. Basically, I, I would like to start with. So basically, a short interruption. Basically, what's it doing? The compat layer is translating the whole syntax to the new internal netting commands, if possible. But this is not fully implemented. If it's not implemented in user space, it will use the compat extension. And so your use uh, your rule set will use um, as far as. The compact, uh, compact um, tool is complete. We'll use um, the new infrastructure, and for the remaining stuff, um, it will use uh, compatibility layer in the kernel. And basically, this will be enhanced up to the point that once you load your rule set using the compact tool and you dump it using the NFT tool, um, you will have a, a complete conversion. Yeah, exactly. So, I, I'm going to to provide more more information in that regard. So, but. But let me let me start. Then let me follow up with with the um, the NFT um, examples initially. So basically, just to create a table, we we just need to. Um, is it, is it that large enough, or should I <laughs> go larger? Go larger. Oh. It's huge already. <laughs> Not so huge. Okay. Well, and so um, if we want to add a table, we just specify um, the command, the object, and then the table name. The table name, I, I could just say test. So I have no limitation or restrictions in, in terms of the name like I can, I can select. Then later on I can, um, List the existing tables that tables that I have created, and also list the table contest of the the content of the table test. Um, this is something that I have to. I'm insisting because I always in my examples use the name filter because people are more familiar with. Well, they they relate that with the names that we used to use in IP tables, right? So, but I mean, there, there are no limitations in terms of the name that you can use. So, now th that table is empty, which is not very useful. So, I'm going to create um, a chain. I'm going to create the input chain in the filter table. And now, um, if I want to create a base chain, what I have to do is I have to um, indicate um, the type of the chain which is filter. As I said, we have three different chains. Depending on the family, uh, we, we may have less. In, the ca in case of the INET family, we only have filter. Okay. Uh, basically, the difference is the filter chain does not um, do any special processing on the packet. It just gets passed to the packet processing engine, and that's it. The route engine is what we used to have in the mangle table. If you do marking in the output chain, um, it used to um, reconsult the routing tables, uh, so you could do routing by packet mark in the output chain. And this is basically what the route um, property, um, route chain type, now does. And we have NAT, which is obviously, um, it just performs NAT setup and then hands off all the packets, um, so you only see the first packet um, for NAT setup. Basically, this, the difference in filter is always uh, the default. So it doesn't perform any special processing on the packets. 
Yes, yeah, so, so you have to indicate the, the, the type, then the hook, um, and then the priority. That, that determines the, the, chain, the, the, the chain ordering in the internet filter pipeline. So in this case, I selected zero. We, we have um, uh, the, the, um, the, first, the first change is uh, the, the um, uh, smallest in integer number and the, the, the last coming, it would be the, what well, would be in max, so. There are predefined uh, tables um, which have um, priority settings which match um, what IP tables used. This is mainly this is not important for uh, not important for filter uh, for input output po uh, forward, but for um, NAT and um, RAW, for instance, um, they depend on whether they come um, are executed before or after the connection tracking sub subsystem, um, where in the kernel there are already registered functions for the hooks. So um, for just filtering, it doesn't make any difference which priorities you, you use. So. Um what what is the reason why we 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 made um, chains um, configurable? So the, there were user rep users reporting um, performance problems with uh, well per performance performance drop um, um, because of empty uh, chains with with no rules at all. So um, we couldn't we couldn't fix that in IP tables without breaking. Uh, uh, breaking the expected behavior that, that the user has been having so far. So now you only, you only have to um, create chains for, uh, uh, for um, the, the, you only have to create the chains that you actually need that, uh, that where, where you actually are going to populate it with, with, with any rule. So, so well, I'm going to create several chains. I could just stay with the input chain. So, for example, for um, in case you want to configure, um, what's going on? Oh yes, this this got unplugged. Okay. So, well, in case, for example, if you go, if you want to configure um, NF table in in um, in your laptop, this this could be this could be um, a basic um, chain configuration. Um, given that it's not going to be configured as a as router, so you don't need forward and... So, um, well, that's basically the basic configurations. Uh, you, can, you could also create non-based non non chains, uh, those non-based non chains. They, let's say, I'm going to call it test. No, I forgot about to specify the table. So th those that no non-based chain test, uh, as you can see, has no has no um, configuration. So it means that it needs to be. You have to add a rule that is going to from from a base chain or another non-based chain that is a, that is connected to a base chain. And so th uh, otherwise, this this chain is not going to see uh, at this moment. It's not going to see any traffic at all. So if we add a rule. Front input. Now, all traffic entering the input path will reach the test, the non based test chain. We could, we could, we could, we can flash the um, rule set configuration while retaining the, the table and chain configuration that we have performed by calling NFT flash table filter. So this rule, you see this one, will be, will be gone. Okay, if we would have had more rules, they, they all um, they, they will they will not they will not show up there. 
Okay. So uh, this this is this is equivalent to the IP tables minus uh, uppercase F that we we used to have. So the the idea with NFT is that um, the, the 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 main idea is that the user doesn't need to type lots of um, selectors. For example, if the user specifies, I want to match TCP the port 22, NFT already interprets that you want to match initially in the IP, IP4 header the protocol um, the protocol number and then inside the TCP header the destination port so and and then once once we have created that modified abstract, abstract syntax tree after the evaluation is stepped it's going to compile it in in netting format um, the name that, that Patrick selected for that, in case you have a look at the source code, is linearization. So the linearization consists of building the, the netlink message that is going to be passed to, to the kernel. Um, we currently uh, create, um, we use a um, batch um, uh, approach to, to send uh, changes to the kernel. Basically, we have an link message that indicates the beginning of the batch and another one that indicates the end of the batch. And between those two messages, we are going to find the messages that indicate um, the command and the object that you want to create, re uh, remove, update, whatever. So all the, the semantics are that all messages that are contained in that batch delimited from by the initial message and the trailing message are going to be handled as a transaction and it's an it's an uh, all or nothing game so uh, the kernel when when trying to load all those new objects or removing objects in case that there is something wrong in in that for example the user is asking to delete a rule that doesn't exist it's just going to um, unroll and undo changes that happen until that thing that was incorrect. So we, we basically have a two-phase um, commit uh, to load the rule set. So in the, in the other direction, um, when um, obtaining um, the rule set configuration, what um, what NFT, will, NFT does is it um, receive it receives the the netlink message, um, then the, then the netlink messages that represent the objects that are currently in in in, in the kernel, and NFT is going to um, decompile that. If you look at the code, the, the name that Patrick selected selected is denationalization. And what, what NFT performs is it, it creates, again, an abstract syntax tree, and that it, it performs another type of evaluation that in the source code is called post-process. And from that tree, it's going to textify, it's going to convert that to the original syntax. So basically, NFT is sort of um, a small compiler and decompiler at the same time to, to, to um, to push the configuration and to when, when retrieving it, to uh, interpreting it to generate the syntax, the text that the user originally created. The linear, linearization and delinearization steps on the, don't really refer to netlink. It's basically in user space you have trees of expressions, um, and the kernel obviously can't have um, objects of arbitrary depth um, because it would have to be dealt with recursively. So what it does is um, the kernel has a small interpreter and the linearization step uh, performs register allocation and flattens the entire tree to a linear stream of commands which um, use the registers to uh, temporarily store data and um, loads it from that. And basically the delinearization step is reversing um, that step. It um, tracks the current register contents and um, rebuilds the expression tree um, based on well, what is currently what has been loaded by previous expressions. So the, this slide is, is showing several ex examples, but I'm going to also to um, 
I'm going to make uh, another demo, adding more rules and generating some, some loopback traffic. So um, in case that we, we want to uh, negate, um, <coughs> we indicate the, um, the key and then um, we indicate that the key is different to, the, to a given value, but we can also specify ranges and those ranges um, uh, indicate an initial value, an initial value in the interval and the end side of the interval. So, well, with all, all these, all these, um, um, all these uh, expressions uh, um, can be applied to, to any any of the keys that 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 we have in NF tables. Um, basically, um, in NF tables, every every time we we needed to to support these kind of things, we we had to come up with a new revision of a given extension, and and add support for intervals. Uh, in NF tables, that that is not required anymore because the way the way it's been it's been designed, um, it 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 it's, it allows us to just to represent any key in this in in the way we want. Yeah, basically, what is happening inside of NF tables, it doesn't really care. Um, the kernel doesn't know about port numbers, addresses, nothing of that at all. So it's just data and user space. Um, all these, um, let's say, ranges, for instance, they also don't really care what kind of data you have. It's just data. It has a start, left-hand side, right-hand side. And that's basically it. And to interpret that stuff, everything is um, also has a data type, which um, specifies size, byte order, um, maximum, minimum values, and so on. And so basically, um, the ranges, the prefixes, prefixes, for instance, don't make sense for any kind of data type. Um, it doesn't make, you could obviously use it for a port number, but um, it doesn't make too much sense. So um, the data types pretty much describe what you can do with um, this specific type. And the expression types, like ranges, uh, prefixes, flag, um, comparisons, and so on there generically. And um, when you add a new data type, um, in IP tables, you would have to add, um, if you have a new match, you would have to add range uh, support. You would have, um, you have the multi-port match, for instance, which um, allows you to use port numbers for um, small sets and all that stuff. This is not required anymore. Basically, the features like set lookups, ranges, all this is, is applicable to any kind of data type. You can use it for anything. Um, and if tables doesn't care, it will interpret it correctly and will allow you to express semantically um, reasonable things, um, which are without any changes. If you add a new, let's say, uh, let's say a negative range or something, inverted range, it would also automatically apply to any data type which are, already exists. So this gives a lot more flexibility and also um, we don't have um, divergences in, in syntax and how stuff is interpreted and what you can and can't do with this specific um, match or um, expression and so on. Yeah, exactly. So, so this, this, well, this, these are just examples of um, um, some of the um, operations that we can perform. Um, we could, we could even, for example, uh, just uh, using assignment. We could, if if both, <coughs> if the if the data types that that represent these two keys are compatible at, at this moment, Patrick already, we already discussed some some casting uh, feature that would allow. Uh, setting to different data types, but basically at this moment, if both have the same data type, um, <coughs> in this case, the CT mark will be set using the meta mark. So, with with this um, rule, we are implemented um, com mark. Uh, we don't need a, a specific com mark extension anymore. We are actually, as I'll show you. We have an instruction, uh, an expression that allows us to fetch the the contract mark. Then we put that in an in a register. No, sorry, the the other way. Uh, we 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 fetch this uh, NF, NFT kernel fetches the 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 packet mark. It's going to put it in in a register, and then we are going to use that value, the value that is stored in that register, to set the the contract mark. Yeah. Um, this also um, brings up one point. Um, basically, all the semantic validation is done in user space. The kernel um, will accept anything which doesn't make it crash, basically, but um, it might be completely uh, nonsense. 
So you can, I mean, the CT mark, for instance, you can set it to any value you want in the kernel. You can also set it to the interface index, which might not be too unreasonable. You can set it to the IP address. It doesn't really care in the kernel um, if it's reasonable or not. Um, everything, the kernel is, NFTables is meant to be one possible user space um, interpreter, basically, and you can write a different one if you want, um, which um, has allows different stuff. Um, we prevent, for instance, to set the CT mark to um, the IP address because they are not type compatible. Um, it doesn't seem to make sense. I mean, you, could, you might come up with a case where this specific one uh, makes sense, but um, let's think of a different example. We don't support setting that much. I can't come up with an example right now where it um, would be completely unreasonable. But the case Pablo just mentioned of using casts, for instance, it might be useful to have the incoming interface um, available in the post routing chain. So in this case, you could actually, we prevent that in user space so that you set the CT mark or the packet mark to an interface index because um, they're not type compatible. But it might actually make sense in this specific case. So if you add a manual cast and say, I know what I'm doing and I think this makes sense, at that point we will accept it. And you can <coughs> use the incoming interface um, in the post routing chain where it's not available anymore um, usually. So any any question so far regarding what? Okay. So let's make a short demo on. So based on the previous configuration that we had. Yes. Yeah, the reason why you you chose to move away from the gets get sock opt and set set sock opt and, and so forth uh, is that be, because of the dynamic nature that you wanted to <coughs> um, um, well we had a couple of problems I mean we probably could have implemented uh, incremental updates using get and set, set sock opt um, but those interfaces don't support notifications um, you would have to open some extra socket subscribe, implement your own notification system. And it's a lot easier to just use Netlink, which already has support for notifications for uh, dumps. Um, basically, Netlink provided everything we wanted. And also, there are generic user space utilities, which might not make sense of the specific NF tables content, but of the remaining Netlink uh, specific parts. And um, in my opinion, a well-designed uh, Netlink subsystem allows you to, without any knowledge, um, take a message, um, flip the request bit and push it into a different kernel and basically you have synchronization, which is also um, it's symmetric. Um, and basically a user space utility which doesn't have any knowledge about NF tables could already do that. Um, so it seemed to provide a lot of advantages over going with a get and set talk opt interfaces. But the, but the user space semantics and so forth, it, that's, it, isn't that independent of the, of the transport whether you push things, yes. things up or down? So it seems like the, it, I mean, the core advantage, like you're saying, then is a notification. Yes, um, notifications and um, easier incremental updates because Netlink is designed for incremental and atomic incremental updates, which at least are atomic on the object level. And um, with get and set talk out, you would have to implement that part yourself and again, and it's already present. Okay, so um, in case we want to add a rule, let's say we just want to add a, um, another, another change in NF tables is that uh, with regards to IP tables, in IP tables the counters were built in in, in, um, in every rule and now counters is something that you have to explicitly ask for. So if I want to attach a counter in a rule to, to the non base test chain. So, I only have to specify counter, and then if I can generate some traffic, whoops. The jump is always missing. The jump is missing, yes, I forgot the jump. So, 
Now you can see now you can see the difference. Uh, the input and output um, chains, which are base chains, are hooked up to the networking stack and the test chain, uh, which is not a base chain, is not connected to anything without the jump. So um, it hasn't seen any packets. Now with the jump rule, you can see that it's actually matched, and the packet counter has counted those packets. Yeah, we can of course uh, combine these with um, um, with other selectors. So one of the further differences is um, in IP tables you could only have one action per packet. So you would have um, either a terminal verdict like accept, drop, queue, and so on, or you could have um, log, for instance. Um, log is um, completely passive, uh, just from the packet processing point of view. It generates a log message, but there's no reason why you can't um, continue on with the packet in the same rule. So if you would like to do two different actions to the same packet, um, you would have to duplicate your rule. In NF tables, um, you can um, use as many actions on the packet as you want, uh, as long as those actions are not terminal, like um, a verdict, accept, drop, um, will terminate the current rule set, uh, the current rule processing, but anything which doesn't, uh, you can just chain as many as you want. Um, so let, let's see how, how you can delete, um, you can currently delete a rule in NF tables. Um, um, at this moment, we, we support deletion by handle number. The handle number shows uh, when we specify minus A. So here you can see. Um, at some point, we will have a, a similar um, way to, to delete rules as, as in IP tables, so we can uh, basically use the same uh, syntax to add and to delete, just modify the command. But at, at this moment, you have to uh, retrieve the handle and then we delete rule from the filter table the input chain and the handle is 7 so it was right to delete it again it says doesn't exist from the syntax point of view, um, the rules, all rules are independent of whether they um, refer to tables, chains, uh, sets, elements, um, rules, um, are always composed in the same way. You have NFT, then you have the action, which is add, delete, list, show. Then you have the object, rule, set, table, chain. Um, then you have the object um, identifier, which in this case is filter input handle 7, which um, is a um, identifier of a rule. A table is identified purely by the name, a chain is identified by the table plus the chain name, um, and it's basically a hierarchy, um, the identifiers, and um, but the rules, uh, the commands are composed in the same grammatical way um, for all the objects, so you will probably get used to, it might look quite verbose, but you will get used to that very quickly if you use it. Yes, actually, my, um, the feedback I received from people that didn't use IP tables so far is that the, when they try to use IP tables, it sucks, um, basically. So, I mean, they 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 have they quickly tell you that this this syntax is is easier too. So, um, okay. Um, so I was. Deleting rules. Yes, we, as I said, we can also flush flush per per um, per chain. So this this flash flashing chain or per chain or per table is something that always respects the 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 table and chain configuration that we have that we have created. It it doesn't. Um, deletes anything in this in this case in, in this um, um, the, we, we are basically retaining the semantics that we used to have in IP tables so the user don't get don't don't get confused if if he migrated from IP tables so but we have new um, new commands also that allows us to to get rid of all the existing configuration or also to operate at, not not only at a family level because at this moment we are all the time working with uh, a table that is part of the IP family, but we 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 have we also have commands to list 
all the existing tables, no matter what family, or for example, getting rid of all the existing configuration, or just get rid of all the existing configuration for <coughs> this table whose family is X. And so I'll show you that as well. Um, but let's just create some, I have some, yes. So I'm going to show you one, another example. This another example. This is another example rule set. I, I, to, to get rid of the existing configuration, I'm going to use flash NFT flash rule set and flash rule set. If I try to, as you can see, we have no tables anymore. So all the tables and the chains they they are gone. We have removed them. Um, so now, if I want to load an existing configuration that I store in a file, we use the option minus F. Um, it's important that you use minus F all the time to, to reload your, um, your rule sets, your configuration. Um, we have seen already on the internet, um, people um, documenting, initially documenting, pro providing some documentation um, on, IP, on NF tables, and they are suggesting others to use scripts. The scripts uh, have a um, have a problem, uh, and they uh, and, the, and that problem is exactly the same problem that IP tables users have when they put their IP tables commands in in scripts, and that is that um, every every command is going to be interpreted as a, it's going to be uh, run as a single transaction. So you are basically um, not getting advantage from the um, transactional support that we provide. So don't, don't use scripts and use NFT minus F. And so with NFT minus F, we reload that existing configuration. So we can list it, it's so exactly the same. Files, they also, you have symbolic definitions, you have um, include statements, and so basically what seems useful for what you would do in a script, um, we support some of that, um, not loops or something to generate rules, but um, the, that might be added as well. Um, but if you are missing some feature uh, in the NFT table syntax itself, um, we will probably add it if it uh, seems useful. Um, I mean, the main point of using scripts is that you can use shell loops, for instance, to generate whatever, read in a file, um, interpret it as IP addresses or whatever. And features like that we would also add um, to the NF tables um, script interpreter. What else? Uh, this is something that also get get um, get uh, confuser get users confused. Um, I already received some some feedback in that regard. If you if you um, invoke NFT minus F again, it's going to it's, it's going to append it to what we have. Okay. So if you want to um, reload a rule set in the same way that um, IP tables restore um, does, you you have to. Well, you have to um, prepend the file with flash rule set, and then if you want to save it, so this all all the as I said all the all the commands that uh, NFT is going to find in a file that you load with NFT minus F are going to be handled as a single transaction. So Flush rule set is going to get rid of all the objects that were before. <coughs> Tables, chains, rules, if we have any set and any other new objects that, that we will have at some point. So we, it will get rid of all that. And it's going to create a new table, a new chains, a new um, rules. So this, this is exactly the same the same the, the same semantics that that you get from IP tables restore. So this also has a problem. The, this approach that is that when you um, if you if you do this, you are going to lose this this the the stateful parts of your rule. I mean, if you if you had counters with values, you are basically getting rid of the old rule with the old counters, 
and loading a new one. So um, if you want if you want to keep your counters for, for the rules that you have, you, you have to perform that in an incremental, you, you have to incrementally update your rule set. And the rules that already are already loaded are going to, to, to keep the stateful information there. Good? So, okay, so, yes. Wait, please. In the, sorry, in the rule set that you have there, yes. if I want to delete one role and add a new role, what would my new transaction look like? That's one delete and one add, or a complete new set? Yes, exactly. You you will you will create a file with let's say I want to delete rule um, five, six, seven. Okay, so I can just create a file. I'm going to reuse this. So if I want to get get rid of these rules, I could just do this. Missing. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Yes. And what exactly that that has, has I have applied has been handled um, in a single transaction. So. Well, the question was about replacing the rule, not about deleting that. Yeah. So the yes. replacing right, you would delete it and add the new one in one transaction. You don't necessarily need to. Uh, use a file for that. You can also specify multiple commands on the <coughs> command line. If you separate them using a semicolon, they will still be applied to the same batch. Yeah, what's very useful is to be able to kill the new set of rules and for something to calculate the delta between the current state and the new state. Yes, that guess we should be useful, sure. Um, that would be useful, definitely, because you could keep state of um, the internal state of the kernel of the old existing rules, um, but this is not supported so far. The replacement feature is, is supported in the kernel interface, but it's not yet exposed in NFT. We, we are still lagging a bit in, some, in, in several uh, fronts in NFT. So, for example, we need a, we need a, that replacement feature, and in the I, in the compatibility layer, the compatibility layer actually already implements it, but you cannot you you will not find it in NFT. So it's a matter of adding the missing bits in NFT user space to. The problem is um, if you want to basically if you don't use the handle, but if you want to delete the rule by specification and then um, or calculate the data and delta, you first have to dump the entire rule set. Then you have to well, calculate the delta to your specified rule set and then update that. And the entire step is not atomic because uh, between dumping the rule set and installing the new one, the rule set in the kernel might have changed. And so um, I'm not so sure if that actually is something we would like to support. Um, we will add uh, deletion of rules by rule sets by rule specifications. So you can basically say delete rule, IIF, uh, loopback, CT state, etc., etc. Um, but this can be done in an atomic fashion, um, but it's um, replacing the entire rule set with just inc uh, incremental updates to the specified one. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Okay, um, and the question on the counters. Uh, the counters are, the, are counting the number of lookups against or matches against the rules, right? If the, the connection track state, it's counting. they're still bypassed. Yeah, it's counting, it's counting every packet that that you um, that that the, that that the expression sees so, and that that brings an interesting point, which is the ordering in which you the, the counter the 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 ordering in where you place uh, counter matters in the rule. So if you put it just before a selector to check if it's matching, for example, the input interface, that counter is going to be updated all the time. So if you place it after, 
if it if it matches, it's going to be updated. Otherwise, not. So Basically, the expression is evaluated, and once the counter expression is hit, if you would say counter IAF low, um, it would count every every packet, and then um, the selector reduces the amount of packets. And if you would have an another counter expression, it would count less and less packets. So you can also use it if you want to debug a rule, for instance. You can pl place multiple counter statements between each uh, match statement um, and see how they differ from each other and at what point it might fail, for instance. But any packets matching connection track state are still not counted. Uh, sorry? Any packets matching con existing connection track state uh, still bypass policy lookups, so they're, they're not counted. Is that true or that's not true? Depends on your rule. I mean, you have you see the city state, new city state, established related. Um, this is basically um, if it matches, if the expression matches, then the counter will increase. Um, the counters have no relationship to connection tracking at all. It all depends on your rule set. So just to provide an example of what we, had, what we are discussing on on the ordering. So it's basically the the rule looks very similar, but counter is placed in a different position. The, the rule is evaluated from, from the left side to the right side. And now if I generate traffic. So the, the, the first rule, the counter is always updated. But the second rule, the counter is not updated because we don't, it doesn't match the, the, input, interf the, the, the input interface different from uh, loopback. So the counters are not validated. Another, another interesting thing that it's not yet implemented regarding counters is currently the counters, they, um, um, they are shared between all the, all the processors, all the CPUs, and we, we, could, we could add per CPU uh, counters so the user could select for some given rule um, this, this feature. This is something that, that Eddie commented in NFL to watch up time ago. It should be very easy to add. In that regard, NF tables comes and the kernel comes with infrastructure to select um, different ways to represent the, um, the the expression that you need depending on the on the attributes that you pass to the kernel. So, um, with with no runtime overhead, we could we could um, we could configure the counter to be to 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 work in one way or another. So at a configuration time, we perform that selection, and we, we select the flavor of the expression, the, flavor, the counter flavor that, that we need. We put that in the rule, and when, when the packet is traversing the rule set, when reaching that expression, it's just going to use the corresponding evaluation function that, that, that matches with, with, the, with that object flavor, with that expression flavor. Can I have a question? So, um, does NetFilter survive a system crash? That's what? the part one of the question, and I have a part two question. What do you mean when you survive a system crash? <laughs> okay, let me explain. So, for IP tables, right, if you start uh, writing the command line to create some rules, as long as you don't restart your system or your system doesn't go down, you are good enough. Once you restart your system, everything is gone. So, you mentioned NetFilter is uh, replacing IP tables uh, based on lessons learned. So, I was wondering if uh, this is one of the lessons learned or not. Well, it can't be. I mean, we are not compiling our rule set in the kernel. Um, so, it's basically, I mean, if you start your system, your system startup sequence is loading, a new rule set it will be there. But, I mean, how should uh, a freshly booted system have any knowledge without you or user space manually restoring the rule set? about any active rules. I mean, we're not putting the rules inside the kernel, just um, the interpreter. Your rule feature should include loading of the rules that boot up time. Otherwise, they're not there. Yeah, th that's what my question was, because uh, we have this issue with IP tables, right? So based on the lessons learned, I was wondering if we have something for the NF tables. Well, it's basically, I mean, this is not a lesson learned. Um, it's, um, you have to design your startup sequence if you care about um, having filtering in place before your network interface is start up. Then you have to design your uh, startup sequence accordingly. This is nothing um, where any implementation can do anything about that. 
I mean, people have asked about <clears throat> changing default policies, and um, the lesson learned is we don't have default policies anymore. So we won't get that question anymore. But um, it depends on your rule set. I mean, you have it's the responsible of, uh, response, the system designer or admin is responsible for putting the rules in place at the time where he wants them. Well, we have we have the the chain default default chain policies, but they they are not exposed yet through the NFT interface. It's something that needs to be also needs to emerge from from the kernel interface. Um, so, what else? Is there a way to validate that uh, a file is correct in terms of syntax without actually executing it into the kernel? You mean, you mean uh, from the semantic point of view? Yes. Well, no. basically, I mean, you could execute it as a user uh, with, uh, without permission, and um, at that point it will go through most of um, the NFT tables code, but there's nothing like a dry run option. Um, I mean, the framework, the framework perfectly allows, allows the implementation of, of such a tool, and, and the, way in, the way we are going to represent the rule set um, it's it it should be I I think it should be easier to to implement that tool in user space using the existing libraries and so it's something that that I think you don't have to implement anything you basically just skip the netting part and um, that's it I was thinking that that might be a useful way of uh, addressing the the concerns here because you might be able to uh, write a correct or write the file that you believe to be correct into the file system in the place where the OS would pick it up when booting. Yeah, uh, and va uh, validate that it's correct, and then actually run um, load it in the kernel. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I mean, it uh, should be completely trivial to um, add an option to do that. Um, basically, it's just about skipping um, pushing it to the kernel, and the remaining part um, you just use what we already have. Yeah, but um, sounds like a good su uh, suggestion. Is there a way to um, to find out or trace the the um, uh, route the uh, specific packet went through the uh, rule set? Yeah, we support the trace um, a trace target similar. Well, it's not called target anymore, but similar to what we have in IP tables. Basically, you have the meta statement. You say I can say meta set trace one, and at that point, the packet will be traced. Yes, that, that is already in place. Um, should be working. This was meta trace set one. This was NF trace. NF trace, yes. Okay, something is broken. <laughs> I will check. Set. Meta and trace set one. You want this, um, meta set trace one, right? No, I think it's fine this way. Should be. Well, the kernel is re reacting. <laughs> it's, it's, the syntax is correct. We, we, we'll check. Uh, do, you, do you guys have any performance numbers, especially when compared to IP tables? Well, this question always comes up. Um, that's a very difficult question to answer because NF tables is built uh, so you won't build your rule sets uh, similar to what you did in um, IP tables. We haven't come to that part yet, but the NF tables includes um, sets and um, for every data type uh, as it's um, at its core, and you're supposed to make use of set lookups basically everywhere where possible. And um, if you use the same infrastructure, it's going to outperform clearly. Yeah, you can build a lot smarter um, matching structures using NF tables, using the features which are provided. So if you would use um, just a linear rule set, um, which doesn't use any of the new features, then it probably would perform worse, I would say. Um, but um, you're not supposed to use it that way. Um, if you just do a really stupid conversion, um, it, it will probably be a little bit slower.
Okay, so more more features. Um, we already discussed about, we already talked about the optional rule counters. We can also place, um, we can also place several actions in one single rule. We, we, that has been a, another feature that um, users has been uh, lacking in IP tables for a long time. Also regarding performance, if you um, not are not only looking at sets, if you look at, um, for instance, several actions in a single rule, you would have to have uh, multiple rules in IP tables to express uh, the same same actions to the packet. So um, if you're using, you don't even have to use sets. This is very common, um, something like that. Um, so you're saving rules, and you're obviously saving on evaluation time of the rules. Um, and there are, we're going to get to more of these features, so there are quite a lot of them. And um, in the end, you're, if you're using them, you should end up with a rule set which is a lot faster than what you used to have. Yes, as Patrick said, the, the, it's very likely that, that you're going to get a slightly less performance with if you, if you arrange your rule set linearly in NF tables, it, it, it's not being designed in that way. Um, so a uh, one-to-one -one comparison is, is not going to, I mean, the, the, the way to, to make it is arranging, rearranging your rule set and then you will get full of the capabilities, full of the NF tables capabilities. Then going back to, 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 the, um, to the features, we also have an interactive mode and uh, it's still, auto completion is still missing. Um, I, have, I have a patch for auto completion which is That's based enough. on the Bison grammar, which is very ugly, but um, it can actually understand the grammar and um, without having speci a specific code for that and complete um, based on what the grammar would expect. Okay, so um, the interactive modes, uh, interactive mode uh, allows us to enter um, a shell a native NFT shell mode. So basically, we can just skip. And we, so far, what we got from uh, LibRedLine is is the history and. So um, that's it. Well, this is this minus A is not working. Okay. We we need to have a way to okay. So well, this is basically the interactive mode. Um, the, the good thing about the interactive mode is that depending on the shell that you are using, um, it, it allows you to skip. We, we've, we've got um, things that the shell can interpret. Um, so with the native not interactive mode, you don't have to escape things. So what else? Um, we have a uh, debugging mode, which is very useful for us in case that you have troubles. Um, basically, the idea is to append, to, to include the option minus minus the bug. Uh, if you include all, it's going to be quite verbose. Um, for example, that's, this is going to show quite a lot of information, so I'm going to dump it in a file. Um, say. Okay. So yes. So while well, this is debugging information from from uh, uh, Bison, oh something was wrong. Okay. So I yes yes. So this this is all the information from Bison when um, when performing the parsing. Oh no, this was wrong again. I expect the end of file. So add filter. Ah, yes, I forgot the the chain. Add rule filter and the chain. Let's say input. Now. Okay, now evaluation wrong. Demo effect. No, it's IEF. Yes, now should be with. Yes, now it's good. So um, after the parsing. 
you can see the information regarding the evaluation and how um, it's going to um, evaluate all the statements that we have that we have passed. Um, so it's basically NF tables is working on the on the um, on the syntax tree that that the parser has created, and then. This can also be useful if you're entering new, new rules and um, the syntax fails for some reason. Um, can I go up a little, please? You want to um, here? If you look at this stuff here, it's parsing. This is a match, basically. It's saying IIF ETH0, and then it's um, descending into the left hand side, right hand side. But you can see uh, the grouping the grammar made. Um, the same thing. Oops. Um, if you go down a little more, we should see it here as well. A little bit down. I guess so. Well, basically, you can see, um, based on the markings, you can see the groupings uh, which um, resulted from the parsing process. So you can see if it matches what you actually try to express. Yes, here in, in evaluation, basically, what is, um, for example, with, with the input interface, it's making sure that the left hand side, well, basically, based on the left hand side that provides the key, the input interface is going to check if the left hand side uh, is a data type that is compatible with, uh, with the key with, with that we are specifying. So, I have a question. So, this about the interface matching, is it still a substring match like uh, IP well, or We support else? both. Um, the IIF is um, the, in uh, the interface index, um, so this is not using names, it's resolved in user space and of course has all the problems which come along with that, uh, mainly that it doesn't follow um, updates. Uh, we also support IIF name, which is the interface name. At that point we have string matching. Um, people have to choose what, what they want to use. Um, I mean, both have their downsides. Um, main problem with IIF is of course if you have um, interfaces which disappear and reappear, um, that the interface index will change. Yeah, exactly, if you work with dynamic um, interfaces, the idea is to use the name which is persistent. Well, it's supposed to be persistent. So can the rule kind of cross namespaces and such? Or is, is there namespace awareness in like IIF there? Well, of course, yes. Uh, well, actually, yes, sure. I mean, they're resolved in user space. Um, we basically, the, the namespace user space is running in, um, in that namespace, the names will be resolved. So when I list the rules, how do they look? They look, um, I mean, same thing. Um, the interface index will be translated back to the interface name in that namespace. So all the rule table sets are a per namespace property? Yes, of course. Okay. Okay, so um, uh, after the evaluation, um, here comes the. Uh, you can see the like addresses, and internally everything is just treated as data. Um, at that point, you see the, the network. Uh, network prefix specification is just translated to some number, uh, which and it helps. Here you can see um, the internal netlink uh, command representation, which basically matches what the kernel is doing. At the first, you have the meter load IIF uh, into register one, which says uh, load the interface index from the SKB, uh, the network interface attached to the SKB into register one, compared to the value two. Um, the comparison is an implicit match. If it doesn't match, the evaluation stops at that point. After that, load from the packet payload, load at the network header position 12 bytes uh, further on, which is the destination address, a uh, source address. Again, into register one, because we don't need it anymore. Um, then uh, for the network, uh, for the prefix specification, we need to um, unmask uh, the bits we are not interested in. And after that, we're doing a comparison, and that's it. Okay. So. So after after the evaluation, what we what we get, we enter the um, the the, com the compilation, the linearization phase, and basically what is going to happen is that um, from the tree, um, it's going to generate the the um, the expressions, the kernel expressions. That so here you can see um, uh, we are going to fetch. Um, the uh, input interface index, and that, that is going to be placed in register number one. And then we are going to compare if that register number one matches two, which is the, 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 the interface index value for, for um, lo the loopback device in this case. So then, then it, it follows with uh, fetching the four bytes um, 
And you see here the network header specifies the base uh, plus the offset, and then the four is indicates the, the amount of bytes that are going to be fetched into that register. And then we follow up with, with a bitwise expression that is basically going to take um, the um, IP address that we have fetched from the packet, for, from the, from the um, destination address field in the AP packet. And it's going to, um, it's going to perform the end, and then it's going to compare it with with a with a with a, with, a, with the result that NFT from users from user space has calculated basically the mask. So it's going to check if if both masks match, and if a CMP is an expression that in case of matching, you told her, oh, okay okay. Okay, so, uh, and, and here, what you can see, it's very ugly, but we can get it a bit better. So then it comes the uh, message generation, the, the initial, this message here that you can see is the, um, um, the message, um, the, 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 um, the begin message in the in the transaction in the batch, then it follows another netlib message that contains the rule. As you can see here, this indicates on um, the table, the chain, and then here we have a meta expression with data that indicates um, the key that we want to fetch, and then the comparison, and then payload, bitwise, and finally the comparison. And this is just one single rule, what I have added. So in this case, it's a very small batch with only one single rule. If you don't specify the trailing message, NFT is going to interpret this as um, as you are testing the rule set if it loads correctly in, in kernel space. So it's, um, if the trading message is not available, it's, it's just going to abort the transaction. So it, it, this was designed in a way to, to, to emulate the, the test feature that, that IP tables store provides to check if, if the rule set can be loaded uh, without problems. So that's basically all regarding the debugging information. And regarding sets, should I continue, Patrick? Uh, yes, sir. So regarding sets, um, we've, got, we've got the generic set infrastructure. Basically, um, um, this allows us to create uh, what we call uh, anonymous sets. The anonymous probably is not, is not a good name, but um, I would call it literal sets. So the main difference is uh, one of them are managed sets, uh, which have a name, um, the named sets, which you can see in the second example, um, which can be updated later on after creation. The literal sets or anonymous sets um, are literal in the rule set, and as such, they cannot they are within the rule and they cannot be changed after um, you created them. Obviously, you can just create another rule with uh, different set contents. Yes, basically, so. So the idea of the anonymous set is that we don't we don't provide an a specific name for for, uh, for that set, but the kernel is going to allocate a, a, a set name for that dynamically. NFT two um, um, is going to spe specify two flags in this case, and those two flags for for this um, for this syntax that that is just below the anonymous sets is going to tell that the set is constant, so it cannot be. Um, Modificated and another flag that is going to say that it, that, that, that says that it, it, it is anonymous, so the kernel has to locate a name for that set. So you can still um, you can still uh, if you I mean if you, you, in that link provides the way to to echo the message when when you set it to kernel space. So you you could you could also uh, get the name that has been allocated if in case that you want to you don't set the constant flag and you want to you want to update it. So. 
Um, the the anonymous set comset is overlapping um, several. It's 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 basically combining the, const, the, the 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 fact that the set is constant, constant, but also that the fact that that uh, we don't we don't care about the name. Just just please allocate a name for me. But from the pro programmatic interface, it it would be able. This set has a name, so you can just fetch that list of sets and and just um, obtain the, the elements that are part of it. So um, the name it sets, they, as, as, as it, it, it engages, it, we, we provide any explicit name in this case. Whoop, the, the, the name is black hole. And then um, it follows the, the data type that we are going to store in that set. And so afterwards, if we, so regarding data type, um, as I said previously, all um, all data in NF tables is typed, and the set of course needs to know the data type for one uh, to check type compatibility when you're using the set, but also of course um, if you add elements, um, the parsing of the elements depends on the type you specify. You can use any data type NF table supports, but you have to specify it. So well, um, as I said, uh, to to add elements, you can. Um, you can uh, use the add command, and then well, it's it is also possible to delete elements, of course. So um, in this case, we we can specify the add command, the object in this case element. Then sets are always attached to a table. So a table is also a container of sets. Set, sets are bonded to a table. In case that you want to have um, a set that that can be used from that that needs to be used from uh, different Change, then you, you have to create a global table, and so you cannot. The, the, the limitation here is that you cannot share a set with, between two different tables. They are bounded to a table. They're bound to a table, and so in this case, it's it's adding two new elements, and then one once we have the set and we have element in the set. I mean, it could be per perfectly empty initially, so that that is no, no not a problem. You only have to attach that set to a rule, and the syntax um, basically is the at symbol. So this indicates that in the filter table chain input, all destination IP address that are contained in the black hole set are going to be counter and are going to be accept. accept. Actually, the, that example should be this should be drop because it's a black hole. So, Excuse but me. yes. <laughs> Excuse me, five minutes left. Okay. Five minutes left? Probably you're really slow. Um, about the sets, um, if you're using, um, used to IP set, um, <coughs> IP setting, <coughs> okay, sorry. Uh, IP set um, is specific whether using source or destination addresses, etc., etc., source ports, destination ports, all that doesn't matter. You can use the set uh, just as well for source addresses or any different kind, wherever you get an address, you can use the set for. Um, so if you're used to IP set, this is quite different. Yes, another, another inter interesting features are maps. Basically, the maps are interpreted in this way. This is a map that, that, that allows us to indicate what source address, source IP address that we are going to use for, uh, for source nothing. So that address is going to be lookup in the set based on the source address. So if the source address matches with this network, the source NAT is going to be performed using this address. So if the source address matches this network, we are going to use, to use this other IP address. Uh, same, same thing applies as um, to all data types. You can not only use it for addresses or NAT or whatever, um, any expression which takes some data from a register can just as well take it from a map. So you can, if you want, for instance, to set uh, mark values for the connection <coughs> tracking or for packet marks, you can also make it build, uh, build it on maps and store the mark values instead of the destination or source NAT addresses, etc. So basically, you can most of the expressions uh, can be para parameterized um, during runtime based um, <coughs> using maps. So this also allows to save quite a lot of rules for many cases. Okay, 
So um, regarding sets, the existing set types that are available in the kernel are the uh, hash table, actually cu currently now converted to use the resizable hash table, and and an RB3. The RB3 is used for interval matching. So um, uh, th this, these are the current existing set types, but they, they will be they will the, the, the infrastructure definitely allows to have more more new different set uh, types. Currently, the kernel selects the best set for you based on a policy. And so uh, the user indicates if, if uh, in the space-time trade-off, preferred memory or performance, and based on that, and the number of sets that are available, um, it's going to tune it to achieve that. And do you want to say anything regarding sets? Mm, oh, no, this part, no. Okay. So another feature that we have in um, with the sets is, um, are the verdict maps. The verdict maps, basically, in this case, what we are doing is we are creating several non-based chains. We are assuming that we already have a filter table. And then we add a rule at the filter table, at the input chain. And based on the protocol field of the IP header, we are going to jump to one chain or another. So this this allows allows us to, to create a, a to arrange the rule set in a in a tree and 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 reduce the number of, of uh, rules that are that need to be inspected in the list in, in IP tables. Uh, this would have required up to up to what well, three rules: one to match TCP, otherwise check UDP, otherwise check ISMP. And then, in case of matching, jump. So, so we are already saving in, in this simple configuration. We are already saving um, three rule um, three three rule checks. If you want to, uh, I mean, if you want to have really performant classification, you will probably arrange your rule set in a hierarchical hierarchical fashion. And um, on the individual levels of the hierarchy to decide uh, where to go next in the tree, um, you would, using IP tables, you could also do that, but you would have to walk through a linear list of rules to decide where to continue. Using the jump maps or verdict maps, um, you can, uh, um, on each level, you can very efficiently decide on which um, further node to continue. So the main idea behind this feature was to be able to implement um, faster uh, classification algorithms entirely in user space and have them build the matching structure in the kernel using these features. But you can also use it for examples like this, of course, um, for um, where you don't build an entire um, structure but just simpler um, decisions. You can also use, of course, the standard verdicts like accept, drop, queue, um, etc. Excuse me, time is up. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, quite a lot, I think. Um, <laughs> I had a, I had a quite a lot of slides about the set implementation and um, the more interesting stuff, um, which unfortunately. Yes, yes, yes. I know some people are interested in that, so we can continue with that later. Yes, and just to show um, the AP table compact, the the syntax. Just before we leave, the IP tables compat um, utility. Yes, I mean you just indicate compat, and the, the output is exactly the same. So you could just use IP table compat save. It's going to save it exactly the same way, and you can just keep it in a file and then use IP tables compat restore, and so it, it works exactly in the same way that it emulates the way that IP tables. Um, provide. So there is still, yeah. Okay, I'm going to start. Um, so just, uh, I don't think we got to this part in Pablo's presentation yesterday, so um, some short uh, overview of NF table sets. Um, they are meant to provide um, fast lookup of data items where you have um, many items of similar type like IP addresses, port numbers, etc. And they're integrated directly into the NF tables core. It's not like IP set, which is an add-on to IP tables. 
and it's not integrated really in any way. It uses the, extent, the, the match and target mechanism, but um, the core doesn't know anything about that. Um, NF table sets, they're type agnostic. They don't care about what kind of data you store inside them. The kernel actually doesn't even know. Um, it's just data, so you can use it for any type, for addresses, port numbers, interface indexes, um, whatever you like. So any data type in NF tables is capable of being stored in sets, and um, so whatever you rule set, um, whatever type you are using multiple times, you can take advantage of using sets to get better performance for matching. As we were talking about during the last presentation of the BOF now, um, we have multiple implementations of sets, and um, the kernel is supposed to automatically choose one uh, based on the data characteristics and the features you require of the set. So um, if you're using, for instance, um, range lookups within your set, um, not all implementations, a hash table can provide that, so it won't be chosen. Um, but you are not supposed to actually know about um, the implementations, and the kernel promises to make a smart decision based on the information it has. So we're actually more interested in having information hints uh, than uh, explicit selection by the user. The more information we have about the data, the better the decision we can make. Um, we are uh, capable of making a better decision. Um, while the set implementations we currently have provide exact matches and range lookups, so you can also put entire networks um, in there. Um, user space prioritizes ranges based on the size of the range, so more specific matches um, will override uh, less specific matches, it's basically li like, <coughs> like routing rules. And um, the sets provide membership queries and dictionaries um, where you can use, um, can also associate some data item with a key in the set and this will provide some mapping which you can use for instance like Pablo demonstrated yesterday to um, get IP addresses for DNet, <coughs> SNet um, based on some different criteria. So you can combine many NAT rules, for instance, in uh, one simple uh, set lookup in one NAT rule. <coughs> uh, we can also map to verdicts, which can be used to build uh, jump maps for uh, more efficient and higher, um, higher complexity data structures. Um, so I think we covered this yesterday. We have um, multiple ways of um, dealing with the sets. One is of specifying them liter literally in the rule set, just in curly braces, um, add the elements you want. Uh, these sets are called anonymous or literal sets, and you can't change them. They're constant. Um, and um, we have the named sets where you explicitly um, create a set which is comparable to what uh, IP set provides. You specify the type and you can use it uh, within the rule set by specifying referring to the set using an add sign in the set name. You can update them, adding elements, removing elements, um, basically what you would expect. Uh, these are dictionaries. Um, we also covered this yesterday, I think, where you can um, map, in this case, addresses to DNAT addresses. Um, we don't support this for um, all types, basically um, some expressions in the kernel support um, taking the data, uh, which is configuration data, um, taking that at runtime from a register and some, ha some have constant, um, <coughs> constant configuration supplied by user space. For instance, um, setting metadata can use sets, uh, using NAT can uh, use uh, uh, maps, not sets. And um, so let's say the reject target can take the reject ICMP code from, from a set. Um, it didn't, uh, that doesn't seem to make too much sense. So we don't support this option. We have the verdict maps. We also covered this yesterday, where you can basically use some criteria to, um, to dispatch the net filter verdicts. And most use, uh, useful case seems to be jumps, so you can build trees um, for more, um, for higher performance classification. And yeah, the main idea of the verdict maps is to build efficient multi-dimensional uh, multi classification algorithms. Yeah, is it possible to get this? Um, yeah, that's more comfortable. Okay, that's better. <coughs> yeah, okay, I'm talking, um, this is, um, future stuff now. Uh, we were actually planning to provide this from the beginning, but it turned out to be more complicated than expected. Uh, concatenations, um, this is a patch set I have queued and which will be submitted shortly. Um, it's meant to um, concatenate multiple different keys 
into one single uh, bit string. So you can, you are not forced to use a single key for the set lookup, but you can provide any kind of keys you want. Um, <coughs> the use case is, for instance, a Mac filter list, which you have on simple wireless routers, which match on the Ethernet source address uh, in combination with the IP source address. So you have two different criteria, and you can uh, so you have to use two keys for the set. Or simple firewalls just match on the IP destination and the TCP destination port or UDP destination port. So using concatenations, as you can see in that example, um, you specify the keys and separate them using a dot. And then the elements are specified in the same way. Um, and it basically matches on multidimensional data um, in whatever performance the set provides. Um, to add these concatenations, um, these require currently the sets in the kernel support only fixed um, fixed uh, data size. Um, the maximum size of a key is 16 bytes. And um, using concatenations, we might require more, for instance, of using IPv6 addresses. Um, but we didn't want to increase um, the set element size for, um, well, basically all the users which are not using this. So um, uh, the patch that I have queued introduces something which is called set extensions, which is uh, some infrastructure to have optional data attached to set elements without wasting too much memory. It basically stores uh, some small integer to some offset where this optional data uh, is located if it's present. It uses a couple of bytes extra, um, but it gives a lot of flexibility to have variable sized optional data attached to elements. And we're using this for the concatenation for the keys for data items we um, associate with um, set elements. And um, it's not only used for the non-optional items, but um, because we need it for the keys anyway, for the concatenations, um, I decided to basically move all the set elements except for the set implementation and kernel data structures to these extensions. So the sets only manage their internal data structure and they always return a set extension and all the remaining handling is um, done outside in the generic code. Um, yeah, people were requesting some features missing from NF tables, um, which were present in IP set. Uh, this includes mainly dynamic updates, adding and removing elements during packet processing um, based on the packet which is currently processed. Um, uh, this example would be um, adding the IP address to some set called FSH. I'm not actually sure what people are using this for, so my example might not be the most useful one, but um, it has been requested a couple of times. Um, if you add stuff during runtime, you need some kind to control, uh, some way to control the size of your set, so you need garbage collection timeouts. Um, this is a second feature which has been added to NF table sets, um, well, which is queued to, to uh, for the next kernel version, basically. Um, you can specify default timeouts per set or add um, timeouts, uh, specify a timeout per element when adding a new element. <coughs> Um, and we have, it's currently only implemented for the R hash table. Um, we have a periodic um, garbage collection which removes dead elements. And um, basically, if they're still present but their timer has expired, they're treated as non existent by the lookup code, by the user space dumping code, and it simply pretends for them to not be there. So the next um, thing we would like to have is um, some. Some features are missing from NF tables, like we have in IP tables, we have hash limit, which is a limit match with per flow state, and um, the per flow state is instantiated dynamically and removed using garbage collection. So basically, this is pretty similar to what we are um, providing with NF table sets um, with the runtime extensions, uh, runtime um, element additions. We have NF ACCT, uh, which are named counters, where the states are also in instantiated and deleted by user space in that case, not during packet processing. We have the quota match, which includes um, state, which is per match. Um, so if you want to have, um, let's say, a flow quota, you would have to have one rule for every flow, which is not very um, flexible. But they all have one thing in common. They keep internal state, which is in some way um, related to kept in a hash table, kept in the rule itself, or kept in um, objects instantiated by the user space. But the other thing they have in common, they all have um, 
the hash limit is basically the implementation of the limiting is exactly the same uh, as for this um, <coughs> for the limit match itself. Um, the main difference is um, the state is not per rule or per match, but is looked up from a hash table. The NACCT is exactly like the regular counter expression, except that the state where the counters are kept is coming from some different place. And for quota, it doesn't support per flow or some, some different um, more fine-grained uh, quota, but it would be useful to have. Um, so what um, is planned to do with, IP, uh, with NF table sets? Um, we have the dynamic set updates. We have timeouts. We have con concatenations for defining arbitrary flow keys. And we have maps to associate arbitrary data with that. So instead of storing verdicts or data, um, the intention is to store private expression state in there, like um, the limit state. So what you would do is um, the <coughs> you would have an expression which says, um, this is my key. And um, whatever you get from the set, pass it to the limit match. So the limit match can store its private data in there. So at that point, without even touching the limit match, you get, um, you get hash limit. You can do the same thing to counters, and you get flow counters. And you can do the same thing to quota, and you get hash quota, basically. Um, the flow keys using the concatenations are completely <coughs> user definable, so you can define your flow in whatever way you want, based on the interface index, based on the five tuples of a connection, or whatever you like. And <coughs> well, I'm sorry, I need air. <laughs> And um, the states um, are either dynamically instantiated, uh, instantiated um, during packet processing. So um, if you have a rule which says um, treat this as a flow, uh, there will be a lookup. If it doesn't exist, a new state will be created. And for instance, limit will be called to initiate this in some way, or the counter if necessary. A counter doesn't need to be initialized. The limit might need to be initialized based on some template. But this is basically the same code which is also used during um, in instantiating new rules when um, adding them from user space. So what we can do at that point, I already mentioned it, we can implement hash limit by simply um, using the regular limit match and stating I want to keep state per flow, in this case using the flow as defined as IP source address and IP destination address. Or we can, in this case, the hash quota would be um, for Ethernet source address, basically what your mobile provider is doing for your um, data rate. You say, I want a, qu a quota of one gigabyte um, for every MAC address I see. And all this doesn't need any changes to the expressions, which are um, um, can suddenly handle flow states. Uh, we can have hash counter, or NFACCT, basically. NFACCT has some different features, but um, the core of it, we can instantiate counters based on some definition of flows in this kind. Uh, in this case, we have the source and destination networks uh, with a slash 24 net mask, and we keep track of how much traffic is flowing between them. Um, NFACCT actually needs a little bit more. Um, counters <coughs> needs, needs to be, uh, user space need to be able to query them. So um, what we have to do, the regular set dumps, um, basically dump the internal state um, of the expressions in the kernel. But we, of course, don't want to dump the data structure. But we already have a way to dump um, counters. We have the Netlink API, which can dump counters, uh, which are used in the regular dual set. So we simply use the same encoding for the set element state. And we'll dump that stuff. And user space can show you the set with the counters, the set with different states, um, whatever you keep in your set. <coughs> so um, the next step, um, if you have this uh, infrastructure in place, the next log logical step, if we can instantiate states in the kernel, we can also create them from user space and store them in sets. And expression, the state, basically what an expression keeps in the kernel, half of that is state, and some have configuration data. But it really doesn't make much difference. Um, so we can also put configuration data inside the set. Um, this allows, if we have, in this example, we have um, two log rules, which differ in the prefix they're using for printing something. This is not something you can currently combine. You have to have these two rules. If you keep the um, log configuration inside the set, um, you can, as you can see in the example, 
you can easily combine these two rules into a single rule where based on the interface, the configuration is chosen automatically. And um, what all of this allows, we currently support um, using match uh, sets for efficient classification, but not for efficient action um, parameterization. So the rule set always consists of two parts. You have the classification part and you have some actions which um, are performed with the packet. And we can um, take advantage of structure in the classification part, but so far we can't take advantage of structure in the action part. And using this infrastructure, we can also try to um, reduce the amount of rules based on structure we have in the action part. And this is basically what uh, is planned for the next one or two releases um, to enhance NF table sets. Any questions? Did somebody understand that? <laughs> yes, sir. Um, <coughs> before you talked about the changing state, I was wondering if there's a way to name the counters. So looks like offline, <coughs> offline you would know what um, the counter belongs to. But Yes, we want to add that. Um, Anna Ray. Um, yeah, she said. She said. Um, she said the packets are already up on the table. I was just waiting for. Yes, um, she actually. I mean, having these. Um, she actually started having NFHTT um, in a way similar to IP tables, where we have separate counter objects and stuff, which main this mainly brought up the idea of using reusing the existing counter objects and just instantiating them in a different way, which then brought up. Our idea of keeping them in sets and basically this all originates in her NFC HTTP patch and the idea is in the end to have something uh, named counter the searcher and um, just some different ways to instantiate them using user space API, using dynamic instantiation uh, during runtime and um, having them in rule set as we support currently. And the counter should be 3321 I guess. Sorry? Looks like a user handle thing there with a filter rule. Uh, that's more like using a common option like in IP tables. I don't really understand the question. Uh, can you use the mic better? Yes. <laughs> uh, you're saying that uh, you allow the user space to store state yes. on a per rule basis. Did I understand this correctly? Or? Well, if you look at the first two rules, um, these <coughs> The first two rules and the third one are equivalent. Um, the first one, um, the input classification. Um, I mean, basically you have ETH0 and you log ETH0 and you have ETH1, log ETH1 in. So the classification part um, depends on, um, you could put that in a set, but it's not possible because the actions differ. So we associate the actions um, with a classification key, um, which is um, what the next thing, um, the third rule expresses. The prefix ETH0 in is basically the data we associate with ETH0, and this one is a log configuration state, um, which we we use the regular log um, netting attributes to encode that stuff, invoke the log expression to build its private data structure, but instead of using its private data, we provide some space from the set, and you get the idea? Any more questions? <laughs> so you, you said the VMAP supports multi-dimensional matrix? Uh, sorry? VMAP, uh, the word is not. <coughs> you can do it with the So the, the word is not supports multi-dimensional matrix? But the example yes, is yes, yes. Um, it does with the concatenations. Um, right now you can only use well, right now you can only use one key and um, using the concatenations, the definition of key changes because we can concatenate multiple different keys and treat them as one single new key. So at that point, everything, every place where you can use a key, you can use multi-dimensional keys. Also for verdict maps, yes. Okay, so uh, at some point uh, you will support something like Yeah, that's um, at least the plan. I mean, it will still take some time, but we want to support it, yes. Do 
Um, it depends. Um, there are supposed to be exact matches. Basically, if you're doing a set lookup, um, because you don't know about the internal structure. I mean, if you do a range lookups, but you have two different data types, it's not really clear what uh, defines a range. Um, but what you can do, if you have, for instance, a set um, which uses net masks, let's say slash 24 in all the single elements, then you can use something like that. But um, other than that, it's currently not, um, it won't support um, ranges on the individual key members. No more questions? Yeah, I mean, I chose this example um, on purpose because um, using the metadata would require stringifying it in the kernel, which is <coughs> obviously not something we want to do. Um, we do support using metadata. Some of these, like the DNet example, which uh, Pablo and I both had in our presentations, um, support taking runtime data um, as parameters. It's supported in some cases. These cases are different. We are t allowing to take entire configuration sets and cho uh, choose them based on some different criteria. Um, it's a little bit, it's both valid cases in my opinion. For instance, we require taking metadata during runtime for implementing conmark because we load the packet mark, we store it as connection packet mark or the other way around. Um, in that case, it's not possible to express that using static, configura uh, static configuration sets. Um, but it's also not possible to uh, express this um, case using um, runtime parameterization without adding like stringifying and all this crap, which we don't want, of course. <laughs> Thank you.